But we are starting a new series uh, called Habits. And, and as I was studying for this series, I, I thought about this one moment that happened in Jesus' ministry. He was preaching to thousands of people, and he preached probably his most theological, scripturally, you know, uh, depth, uh, deep message out of all the sermons that we have recorded of his. And everyone turned and walked away except for 12 people. I mean, he, he, like, he just he went all in and everyone walked away except for 12 people. And he looked at them and he said, are you guys going to leave too? I said, where else will we go? You have the words of life. And some people would look at that moment and say, oh, that was a, that was a loss. But see, Jesus wasn't about just building crowds. He was about turning crowds into disciples. And this summer, we're jumping into the series called Habits because we want to look at what are not just, what's just not a good habit that makes me a good person. Listen, if you're on social media, you know that it, the latest trends, you got to get up before 5 a.m., you got to take a cold shower, or maybe you need to buy an ice bath so you can take ice. I mean, we got all the stuff, right? But what are the things that make us a disciple of Jesus, and what does a disciple of Jesus make us, right? How do we become more and more like Christ, because this is, this is big. And, and unfortunately, I would say it, it's sad that this is kind of an uncommon thing even in the church world. There's a common phrase. I would say it was, this phrase is true of us. So we would say, hey, come to our church as you are. Wherever you are in life, just come. You are welcome here wherever you are in, in life. Where some churches... Um, miss the mark, though, is they say, come as you are and stay as you are. But that's not what happens when we encounter Jesus. Right? That's not what I'm... I don't want to sign up for the stay as you are camp. Right? Like, I want to find freedom in my life. I want to know God more tomorrow than I know Him today. I want to experience more freedom in my life than I've experienced thus far. I want to discover purpose. I want to make a difference in this world. I don't want to stay right where I am. And so, yeah, let's come as we are. But the moment that you experience Jesus fully, something should shift in your mindset. I'm not just here for His grace. I'm here for everything else He has to offer to. Because if His grace was that amazing, then I want everything else that He has for me. So when I, when I give my life to Christ, when I go, God, forgive me of my sins, and He wipes them clean as freshly fallen snow, and then I say, God, You are Lord of my life. At that moment, I begin a new journey of becoming a disciple of Jesus. A disciple is someone that says, I'm going to learn everything that you have to teach me because I want to become like you. I want to become like you. So I'm not bringing to Jesus the latest book that I read and said, hey, Jesus, I don't know if you ever thought about this before. I'm not, I'm not even bringing to Jesus, hey, here's some ideas I have about the world. I'm coming to Jesus with a pen and a blank sheet of paper, and I'm saying, what you got for me? Tell me something I don't know. Tell me something I think I know, but I really don't know. Like, I'm here to learn from you. And it's not just to amass more information. Knowledge is helpful, but knowledge is limited, right? And so I'm not just about going, God, teach me all of the, the things I need to know, but show me who I'm supposed to become as I become like Him. And so this summer, we're looking at small disciplines that have big results, right? They're, they're things that we actively get intentional about but it's not just this work that we are doing that's producing something in us. It's a work that we are doing 
in conjunction with the work that the Holy Spirit's doing in us. And the results are, is we start to look a little more like Jesus. And I don't know how you read history, but Jesus changed the world. And I think if more churches could be filled with disciples who are becoming like Jesus, we just might see this world change. It's funny how the religious leaders of Jesus' day were looking for the Messiah to be a political leader. They were looking for the, the, the Savior to be a, a governmental figure. I think we kind of fall into the same trap today. And we miss the multiply, multiplied magnitude of what could happen when just a group of people start to act like Jesus. So we're going to become those people. Now, if you're new, you may be kicking the tires. I invite you to join us each week as we go. Let's unpack a different dimension of what it means to be a disciple. And let's look at that. And, and how do we begin to practice that? And how do we develop that so that we become more like him? Because the more we become like him, the more the world starts to be impacted. And so... There's a few different dimensions of a disciple that we're going to look at this, this summer. And the one that I wanted to start with was probably the one that years ago would have been the one I would have been most apprehensive to even talk about. But God's done such a work in me. I didn't stay the same. God's done such a work in me in this whole concept, in this whole area, in this, in, in even just the hopes and dreams for my own life in this particular discipline, that I was like, oh, we got to start here. We got to start here. And it's in the area of generosity. In the area of generosity. And if you hang around our church for, for a period of time, you're going to pick up on something. We will never ask you to give, but we unapologetically are excited about what we get to give to and we know that we get to be a part of something pretty amazing now the scripture I want to jump into at first is an interesting passage in the book of second Corinthians I say book we call them books but originally it was a letter it was a one of the letters that Paul had written to the church in Corinth and there's a couple chapters of this letter that he's actually taking up an offering. Like, pastors should probably do a little more reading of chapters 8 and 9 of, of 2 Corinthians because they learn a little bit better about this concept. Uh, but he's actually in the middle of taking up an offering. He's writing to the Corinthian church, and he's taking up an offering that they've done before. And he's so enamored by the way that they have been generous in their walk with faith that he's even like prior to the, this verse I'm going to read, he's saying, listen, the way you have given have inspired other believers to want to give like you. And, and it's, called, it's caused a, it's, it's this thing that's contagious. More and more people are wanting to be generous. And he's saying, listen, I, I, I'm letting you know I'm sending people to you to collect this offering because there's so many things that we're going to be able to do with that. And he throws in this little nugget of truth in, in 2 Corinthians 9-11. He says, and you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I want you to understand today that disciples of Jesus develop a habit of generosity. He said, on every occasion, God's going to equip you so on every occasion that you're able to walk in this attribute, in this character quality. I would say that Jesus was as generous as it gets. He gave his own life for us, right? And the more we become like him, then we should become generous people. But we have to ask ourselves, why don't we though? Why, why is there such a resistance against this concept of generosity? Why, why do we push back on this and why is it something that we want for ourselves, but yet we resist developing in ourselves? 
We, we make generosity dependent on our financial situation. We equate generous intentions with generous actions. We, we think that when we drive by the lottery sign and imagine ourselves winning the lottery and what we would do with it, that it's the same as us actually doing something. And in, in a way, it's almost like we're waiting to feel generous before we act generous. So there's a lot of things that are standing in, in our way here. And, and the crazy thing is... That the road from where we are to being a more generous person all around, nowhere in that road is it dependent upon a change in our financial situation. It's a change in mentality, it's a change in heart, it's a change in habit, it's a change in practice. So if your generous intentions are held captive within you, then they will never impact the world around you and we we know that as disciples we become more like Jesus and the more that we become like Jesus the more the world gets affected by who Jesus is now the problem is is maybe you've had experiences like I've had I've seen this message uh, this this word generosity this concept of generosity especially in the church world get abused and get misused by misled spiritual leaders and, and it, what it does is it makes you become somewhat resistant. It, it makes you hold off. It makes you push back. And, and I've had that experience growing up. And even when, when certain journeys, you know, steps in my journey, it was like, well, I guess I have to do this or I maybe. But something sh- began to shift in my life years ago where I understood, like, wait a second, this, the narrative of the misguided leader shouldn't supersede the narrative of God's Word. And if God's Word is so rich with meaning and teaching and and all of these things, if generosity is something that I wish I had, then why would I be resistant to that which I want? I had to step back and I think in my journey, I began to realize that giving actually is good. In high school, I, um, I wrecked my girlfriend's car. Uh, thankfully, it worked out. She ended up becoming my wife, praise the Lord, right? But I'll never forget wrecking her car. I mean, it was, I plowed into the truck right in front of us, called her dad. That was a fun phone call, right? And uh, he ended up fixing the car, and I, I had a bill to pay to her dad. So every month, my, my 16-year-old self was writing a check to help pay off this repair. And I remember, it was probably maybe four or five months in, it had uh, become a new year. And I went to go to deliver the check to her, her dad, and he said, um, oh, you, don't, you don't have to give me checks anymore. I was like, he said, it's the year of Jubilee. I didn't have a clue what he meant by the year of Jubilee. And listen, I, that's, there's a whole other sermon we could talk about, all the different things that God has in, in the Bible about generosity. But apparently the year of Jubilee, simple answer was every seven years all debts are canceled. And he goes, it's the year of Jubilee. You don't owe me anything anymore. And I just remember that level of generosity impacting me in such a positive way. And impacting my pocketbook too, right? And, and it was moments like that through my life that were these light bulb moments that say, wait a second, giving is a good thing. And if giving is good and if giving is godly, then why don't I embrace this as a spiritual discipline, a character quality of Jesus that I want to incorporate into my life? See, generosity begins at the point where we realize that God has given us all that we have, and it's then that we begin to distribute His resources according to His character. 
And that begins to change everything. So there's a few things I, I want to teach you today about the discipline of a disciple in the area of generosity. The first one is this, is to trust God with the tithe. To trust God with the tithe. Now the tithe is mentioned all throughout the scripture, New Testament, Old Testament. You may not know what the tithe is, but I'm going to teach you what it is. Leviticus 27.30 says, A tithe of everything from the land, back then income was what you, your produce and your crops was your income. It said, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. So this first 10% of the income, there's the Bible saying, this belongs to the Lord. Now what's interesting is, is while in Leviticus is the first time we see it written, this isn't the first time it's practiced. You, you can read in Abraham's story how Abraham was tithing. Uh, many scholars even say you can go back and if you really want to understand why Cain and Abel had an issue... Is because one of them was tithing and one of them was just giving whatever they thought that they wanted to to the Lord. And so you can go back all the way to the very first family and you see this principle of the first 10% being something that you give back to the Lord. It's kind of like God already budgeted part of your income for you. Now, you can like that or dislike it. Right? Because I, I, have, I have friends that their HOA has already budgeted a portion of their income every single year. And some of them like it and some of them don't. Right? Their gym membership has already budgeted a certain portion of their income to that gym membership. And some people use it and then others who signed up for Planet Fitness, don't use it, right? Like, we, we, we create these relationships, and it's fairly common in them that we, some of us, some of us, we, the car loan that we got, we committed a certain percentage of our income for so many years, and we either like it or we don't like it, Right? And, and when it comes to our income, the Lord's already budgeted out 10% of it. He said, hey, I, I want you to practice something here. Put me first in the area of your income. Because I want you to put me first in every area of your life. I'd love you to put me in the first part of your day. Every day I would love for you to just start and spend it with me. I'd love for you to take the first day of your week. And I would love for you to come and worship me. I, I'd love for you. We even do this the first part of the year. We, we take a time and we say, hey, this is going to be a season of prayer and fasting. We want to take the first part of the year and do that. And then we take the first part of our income and we give it to the Lord. The, the Bible talks about how you bring that into the storehouse, the place where you are fed and ministered to. And the Lord works through that. We seek him first and all that. Now here's what's interesting about the principle of tithing. Is that for many of us, we, we think that it is the epitome of, of what the Bible talks about in terms of generosity. But it's actually the training wheels. It is the thing that is supposed to help build up the muscle memory of generosity in our lives. Jesus even addressed this with the spiritual leaders in his day and age. In Matthew 23, 23, he looks at them and he says, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? He says, Hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. I love how Jesus is like... He's like, listen, you're picking little pieces of sage off and counting them. And like, you've got this down to a science, right? He says, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. He says, you should tithe. Yes. But do not neglect the more important things. This, this, this 
thing that Jesus is doing with the Pharisees is not an uncommon thing that he would do. He would say, hey, you know what? You've heard that you shouldn't commit adultery. Yes, you shouldn't commit adultery. But I'm telling you, you don't even lust after people. He's saying, you've heard it said that you shouldn't kill people. Well, I'm going to take it a step further. I say you shouldn't even hate people. He's saying, yeah, you're, you're, you're counting down even the amount of herbs that you have and getting the tithe exactly right. Yes, that's great. But I want you to understand that generosity affects every aspect of your life and you're missing the point. I don't know if y'all have ever seen the, the newer Karate Kid movie, the one with uh, Jackie Chan in it. I love this moment that happens where he's, he's, he's got the, the young karate kid, right? He's been spending all this time showing up. He wants to learn how to fight. And I'm, I don't remember his exact name. He's probably not Mr. Miyagi in that movie. Maybe he is. I don't know. Uh, but let's just say Jackie Chan has him hitting this wooden stick over and over and over. Every day. He's like, all right, I want you to hit it here and hit it here. And the kid just gets angry after a while. He's like, I wanted to learn how to fight. And what you do is you keep having me come here. And I just have to hit this stick over and over and over and over. I got to do this over and over and over. And then finally he shows them. And he, he begins to spar with him. And he begins to realize, wait a second. All those movements that you've been having me do with this stick. You were actually building muscle memory for the real fight. See, tithing is just building muscle memory so we know how to be generous in all areas of life. And he says, if you can learn how to release that first 10% of your income, all of a sudden you're going to learn how to step into moments and use, be used by me that you were never even seeing before. See, while a tithe comes from the income, generosity comes from the heart. It's a heart muscle that we are working out. So we got to trust the Lord with our tithe. That's a, at the first place to start to work that muscle out. And then we plan our generosity. We plan it. We plan to do things with, with our lives all the time. I plan to go to college. I plan to buy a house. I plan to get a car. I plan, plan to uh, get some clothes. I plan to go on a diet. I plan to, we plan all kinds of things in our life. If this is a character quality that we're wanting to develop within us, we plan our generosity as well. It says in Isaiah 32, 8, it says, But the generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, that same passage where Paul is taking that offering, he says, Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, giving isn't something we do. Generous is who we are as Jesus followers. And the attitude of your giving is greater than the amount of your giving. See, the moment of generosity might be spontaneous. But the plan to be generous, I decided a long time ago. It's, it's kind of like this. Every time I'm at a door and someone else is at that door, I'm going to open it. That's just the kind of person I am. Now, I don't open doors for every human on the planet. Right now, there are people walking through doors, and I'm not there to open it. I know it's sad. But I have already pre-decided in my heart, in my life, that if I'm at a door and someone else is at that door, then I'm the one holding it open for them. The same is true with generosity. Like I just, I'm pre-deciding in my heart when there is a need and when there is a circumstance. I'm already budgeting the money. I'm budgeting the time. I'm budgeting all the things. But I'm mostly budgeting the attitude of my heart that says whenever there's a door, I'm opening it. Whenever there's a need, I'm responding to it. That I'm positioning myself in a place that says, God, if you use people like a funnel to funnel your resources into people's situation, then let me be your funnel. 
So I'm going to plan that. I'm going to pre-decide that. And see, generosity goes beyond money. That's why I said tithing is just, it's just hitting the stick so you learn the muscle memory. Because generosity has to do with our time. It has to do with our talents. I was thinking this morning, even as we were worshiping, I was just thinking about the level of talent that was on this stage. And none of them were up here. None of them were up here for a paycheck. None of them were up here for income. None of them, all of them were up here just going, I've got a talent and I have a heart to worship Jesus. So let me bring that. And I'm thinking, some of you are going, well, I just, I don't have that talent. Listen, some of you, you know how to organize things and you know how to type. You can type like 8 million words per second, right? you got some different things and you go, man, I'm going to set aside my talent and be generous with it. My time and my talent, yeah, my resources. I'm going to have an open hand with it because if I can get that first release... And then just start living my life with a hand open. There's no telling what the Lord will distribute to others through me. And that's a pretty cool place to be. This past week, Steve and Terry Allen, Steve's one of our trustees at our church. Uh, they were able to go to uh, Mallorca, Spain. Uh, on behalf of our church, uh, a couple years ago, we all gave a significant amount of money to help build a church there. First church being constructed on this island 60 years. And uh, because if you know anything with building costs and all that over the past couple years, a lot of stuff's been delayed. We need to get them across the finish line. And so Steve and Terry went there, and, um, and, and Steve's texting with me and going, hey, what, what more do we want to contribute now, the beauty is, is Steve's going, and we've already pre-decided we're going to give something, right? And we're, and we're going, well, how do we want to do this? Like, we as a church don't exist just so that we can come in here on Sundays. But when we come here on Sundays, we get to go, what do we get to do around the world? That's exciting. That's exciting. I text him one number. He texts me one bigger. I'm like, we'll go with yours. You know, like, and that's a fun place to be. Third thing is start being generous now. Start being generous now. For the sake of time, I want to share one story and, and share one final thought with you. Years ago, there was this bad uh, snowstorm in Birmingham. You may have remembered this moment that happened. It was on the national news. Uh, Birmingham, Alabama does not get snow very often, which means there are not trucks that go around and put salt on the roads. It means that cars are not equipped to handle it. It means when it snows, it is a hot mess in Birmingham. And well, there's one road you don't want to be on in Birmingham, and that's 280. Well, it just happened to be everybody's trying to leave work because it's this impending snowstorm. And they're all on this massive road, 280, and the snowstorm hits, and they get stuck. The Chick-fil-A right on 280, they just closed early to send all their workers home. But the problem is their workers can't get home because the road is a parking lot. And it's got these, sub, you know, these freezing temperatures and everybody's stuck in their cars. And the, the, the operator of the restaurant starts seeing all the employees start coming back. He sent them home. They start coming back. He's like, what's up? And they're like, we can't go anywhere. And there was something that just clicked because of a character quality that was already present in them. They said, well, let's fire up the, the fryers and let's start making some chicken and let's just start taking it out to the, the road and let's start giving it to every car that we can. And all these Chick-fil-A workers who were sent home instead ended up spending the next few hours bundled up taking hot Christian chicken to people stranded on the side of the road. And listen, Christian chicken may not change the world. 
but that generosity impacts people. There's a, there's a glitch in Darwin's, you know, survival of the fittest, right? One of the glitches in his survival of the fittest is when people act with generosity towards one another. See, survival of the fittest makes sense if, I got, if I've got a cup of water and I just drink it myself. But it falls apart when generosity enters my heart and I see someone else who's thirsty near me and I take some of my water and I give it to them. And there's something about this faith that we have, this Jesus that we follow. He's just generous. And so this this final thing I want to say to you, I want it to settle Generosity should be our normal, not our exception. I wish I could preach this message and just say, who you're looking at right now is the most generous person on the planet. I'm not, but I'm trying to be. I'm not, but I hope to be. In fact, one of the few things on a very short list of of things that God's put in my heart to do with my life has to do with the area of generosity. And I'm just going, God, help me move from where I am to where you want me to be. And I just know his generosity changed the world. And so I'm excited to see what our generosity can do in his name as well. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? How can you take a step towards generosity this week? You help someone out bring something into work rearrange a schedule a budget and maybe there's someone that's in this room maybe someone even watching online right now I want you to know this generosity thing is something It's only been perfected by one. And that was Jesus. The most well-known verse in the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave. And what did he give? His one and only son. So that whoever believed in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. His generosity and sacrifice paved the way for you, every single sin you've ever committed to be forgiven. Why? Just so that they would be forgiven? No, so that you would use that fresh start to be in relationship with your creator. And so right where you are, if you've never stepped into a relationship with Jesus, I want you to know you don't have, have all the answers figured out. You just need to You just need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died on the cross for your sins and that you're willing to put your trust and your life in His hands and He'll take care of the rest as you become a disciple. If that's you, I just want to lead you in a prayer right where you are. Jesus, I give you my life put it in your hands you can have it all every day every breath you can have it all God I know my sin has separated us and so today I I put my faith and my trust that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was sufficient to pay for my sins and so I'm forgiven I use this new beginning, this fresh start, God, to look to you, to follow you, 
to give my life to you. I want to know what it's like to be in relationship with my creator. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.